I'm getting almost as bad in Matthew as I am in Proverbs on Wednesday nights. We're going to be covering a whole two verses. So buckle up, as I say. <laughs> It's been kind of a heavy chapter, as it not, as we talk about persecution, as we talk about how the world is not always going to be fond of, of the church and its message. So as we dive into Matthew chapter 10, we, I want to remind you of last week, that we are to fear God over man. Jesus makes that point very clear as he talks about what man can do to us. Because man can certainly harm us in many ways. Man can kill us. They can. And Jesus didn't want his disciples, when he was about to send them out, to be, to be unaware of that. He goes, guys, you will be killed for preaching the gospel, for preaching truth. Especially when people don't want to hear truth, when the truth is unpleasant. They don't want to hear that. And it can make them angry. They will turn against you, and they will hand you to their rulers. They will hand you to the governors. They will destroy you. But do not fear them. Fear God. Because see, man may be able to kill you, but if your choice is between fearing man or fearing God, serving man out of fear or serving God out of fear, you ought to choose God. Because God can do so much more than kill you. But yeah, he can kill you any second. We have several accounts in Scripture of people who broke their promises to the Lord, did things against the Lord's law, broke his law, and God actually killed them on the spot. But even worse than that, then their souls, their eternal destination is in God's hand. So he says, do not fear a man which can kill the body, but fear God, who can destroy both body and soul in hell. That's the wording Jesus has used there as the strongest definition for hell, if you remember. It means eternal torment. So Jesus says, guys, if you have a choice of fearing man or fearing God, you ought to fear God. But he doesn't just leave it there. You see, God isn't just, isn't just some tyrant, some evil man, it just the evil God that just delights in harming us. No, he then goes on to say, remember that God also cares for you. God cares for you immeasurably. He says he takes note of when the sparrow leaves and takes off and when it lands. And a sparrow is sold for what? A penny? How much more does God care about mankind whom he created in his image? It says he counts every hair on our heads. That is how much God cares about us. And so God can do terrifying things, but God also is a good God who keeps his word, who cares about us. You think man cares about you? Mankind as a whole is a very selfish creature. We are self-serving creatures. God is not. God has no reason to pay mind to man, and yet he does. Because God is selfless. So we ought to fear God, but we also ought to trust him. He is far more trustworthy than any man. And so that's where Jesus uh, brought us to by the time we reach verse 32, where we're going to be this morning. Let's read it. Verse 32. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. I'm going to give you two Greek words here. The Greek word for confess and the Greek word for deny. Excuse me for a moment. The great thing about technology is sometimes it decides to update whether you want it to or not. So my notes have decided to uh, take a nap. So I've got to pull them up on my phone real quick. All right, so don't worry, I'm not up here texting. I, I'd be a horrible multitasker, anyways. <laughs> um, so here, when Jesus talks about us standing before God, he says, we're standing, rather, when we stand before men, we stand before the rulers of men. Because in verse 17, he talks about there will be men that hand you over to their courts, that hand you over to the synagogues, that will deliver you over to the governors and, and before kings. Why are they delivering you over to them? Because you believe something they don't want you to believe. Because you hold to Jesus and you say that Jesus is your king, and that contradicts what they want you to believe. And so he's telling his disciples here, they will bring you before them, 
And they will ask you, do you serve King Jesus or do you serve King Caesar? And then you will have a choice about whether you will confess. The word confess there means to have the same words. So when someone brings a charge against you and say, are you or are you not a Christian? Are you a Christian? To confess means to agree with that charge. To say, guilty as charged. I agree, I am Christian. I am of Christ and I bow my knee to only King Jesus. It means to agree. Whereas to deny means not to speak up. When someone says, are you a Christian? You're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Sound familiar? The word deny there is the same word that was used of Peter when he denied Jesus. In Matthew 26, it talks of Peter's denial. It says, Peter denied before everyone, saying, I don't know what you guys are talking about. Jesus who? Again, when he was questioned in Matthew 26, 72, Peter denied with an oath, I promise you, I do not know that man. And upon the third denial, as he denied Jesus before men, it says Jesus actually in the distance, as he's being dragged away, still being dragged away by the Romans officials, turns his head and locks eyes with Peter. And the rooster crows as Jesus had prophesied. And Peter wept bitterly when he realized what he had done, especially with this in mind. I just denied my Lord? Well, he denied me before men? No. We'll get to what happens if you deny the Lord. Is there no hope? We'll get there. That's actually something the early church struggled through. We'll get there. But uh, what Jesus is saying here, essentially, is if is you have a choice. Are you going to follow Lord Jesus, or are you going to follow men? And if you remember Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he talks about this over and over again. Will you serve men, or will you serve God? Do you remember in Matthew chapter 6 how it goes? You guys, when you pray, don't pray openly before men to be noticed by them. Pray in secret so that your prayers are only heard by God. What he's saying is, are you going to Pray so that you can be seen before men, or are you going to pray so that you can be seen before God? Are you going to serve man or God? Are you going to enjoy man's praise or God? It does the same thing with giving. Is your giving, what do you give in public so that you can be seen by men? Do you tell other people about your giving? Or do you give in secret because you truly just want to give back to God, and that's all? Same thing with fasting and other religious rites. Will you serve man or will you serve God? That's what the Sermon on the Mount is, is essentially all about. And then he gets to Matthew chapter 7. If you turn there with me. Matthew chapter 7. Go, to, go with me to verse, uh, verse 21. He says... Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? This is Matthew 7, 22. They will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons. And in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What's happening here is these people, on the day of judgment, where we all will stand before God, people, everyone, will declare that Jesus is Lord. Everyone will call Jesus Lord at that time, because that's what's popular, that's what's convenient. So of course everybody's going to say Lord, Lord. When they realize not saying Lord, Lord gets them thrown into eternal fire. They'll be saying, Lord, Lord, look, I did this for you, I did this good thing, and this good thing. Lord? And he's going to look at them and say, who are you? I remember you. I remember when you stood before men and you had a choice between man or God. And you chose man. So I'm sorry, but I don't know you. That's what it means when Jesus says he will deny. But then there are those that will come to him and say, Lord, Lord. And he will look at them and he'll be like, I know you. I know you. When man came to you and dragged you off before the courts and they put a knife to your throat, or let's bring it home to today, they put a gun to your head or whatever else. 
where they were threatening to throw you in prison or separate you from your families, real things that happen in foreign countries. And they put you on the spot like that. And your life was in their hands, and yet you realized your life was really in God's hands, and you looked at them and said, yes, I am a Christian. You swore me when it was not convenient for you. You held true to me because you know me, and I know you. Come into the kingdom. This is what Jesus means at the beginning of his Sermon on the Mount when he says, who is it that inherits the earth? Who is it that inherits the kingdom of heaven? It's the meek. It's those who are poor in spirit. Those who were downtrodden by the world, the persecuted, said, blessed are you when you were persecuted for my name's sake, for you will receive the kingdom of heaven. This is what he means. Will you fear God or will you fear man? Now, Philippians 2, 10 through 11 tells us that someday, Every name will bow. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. It, says, it actually says every, uh, everybody in heaven, everybody on earth, and everybody under the earth. If you remember, under the earth is a reference to the holy place of the dead, what the Hebrews would call Sheol. It's where all the dead would go and await the day of judgment. And in heaven could be those who Jesus has brought from Sheol up to heaven when he rose from the dead. It could, be, it could be simply a mention of the angels, but certainly everyone ever created and, and all of creation will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord at that day. But why don't people acknowledge Jesus is Lord today? Simple, because it's not convenient. Because when the culture makes it uncomfortable to believe in Jesus, makes it uncomfortable to swear to King Jesus, it no longer becomes fun to be Christian. And it loses its, it loses its um, weight in this life when we realize being Christian is not part of the cool club anymore. Romans 8, 16 through 17, it says, The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then we are heirs, inheritors of God's kingdom, joint heirs with Christ. We love saying that, but we do not finish that verse often, provided that we suffer with him. Then we may be glorified together with him. Guys, Jesus is not a buffet. He's not some card you can pull out when it's convenient and you can tuck away when it's not. Jesus is your life. My life verses, Colossians 3, verse 4, says it very plainly. Your life is hidden with Christ, and when life who is your life appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Jesus has become our life. He is our new life. He is our one connection to God. So do not forsake him. Hold fast to him. He is your lifeline. Even when holding to him would see you dead, he is your lifeline. But you know, Many people in history have denied Christ and then regretted their decision and longed to get back into the church, longed to get right with God. And the early church struggled through this. Is it possible for that to happen? The early church struggled through this a whole lot because the early church went through some incredible, and by incredible I mean awful, persecution. One of the major persecutions was under Emperor Decian in 250 AD. Emperor Decian wanted everybody to be uniform in religion in the Roman Empire, and he wanted them to sacrifice to Roman gods. And so he realized they're going to have some trouble with that with the Christians. So what they did is anybody that was Christian, they would drag to the closest temple and put them to the test and see if they were going to sacrifice to the Roman gods. And if they sacrificed to the Roman gods, then they got a certificate. And that certificate was proof that they had converted to the Roman faith. And it was what allowed them to buy in the markets. Hmm, does that sound familiar? Sounds like taking the mark of the bees. And so the church, right, well, the church thought this. They thought, wow, they have chosen, they have chosen the world over God. They are now eternally damned. And they were reluctant 
to allow these people back into the church. The, the people that had turned from their faith were known as lapsy. They had those who have lapsed, those who went back to their pagan roots. And yet they're, the clergy and the bishops at this time, they were so scared of this test, the pastors of the church fled, leaving the church leaderless. But as, they weren't as bad as those lapses, as those people who have lapsed. They didn't sell themselves, they just ran. And then there was those who didn't forsake their faith, who when dragged to the nearest temple, stuck to Christ. They confessed Christ, and so rightly, they were called confessors. And these people, they were dragged off to prisons, they were fined, tortured, often released, though, eventually. And they were the ones that ended up stepping into the role of the clergy and the bishops who had fled. And so they led the church in this dark time, those who kept true to Christ, who acknowledged Christ the Lord, even when it wasn't convenient, they led the church in this dark time. And then after the persecution, when Decian stopped this persecution, then the bishops came back, and there became a power conflict. Because surprisingly enough, the clergy, the ones who had fled, the cowards, they were the ones that were like, no, these lapsy that want to come back into the church, we won't allow it. We don't allow that. And it was the confessors, those who put their life on the line and declared Christ, were saying, no, they can be forgiven. They were the ones that stuck up for the lapse. And so they, they wrestled with this. They're like, how do we reconcile with this? Because they have committed an atrocious sin. How do they get right with God? How do we know that they're not just going to, not just going to turn tail and, and, and forsake Christ the next chance they get, the next chance there's any persecution, and sell their brothers in, in Christ over to the Roman governments? Fear was talking to them. We can't forgive them because what if they turn against us again and cause the church harm? So they said, all right, we need them to prove their repentance. And so they came up with this system called penance. Some of you who are Catholic, you know penance. It has, it has devolved a bunch since that time. But essentially, what they did with penance here was depending on the extent of the person's betrayal, the extent of them denying Christ and what they did, if they sold their, their brothers or sisters over to the Roman government or not they would have different levels of penance they had to do, different punishments they had to do. And having gone through those punishments, as long as they served their, those punishments, then they could come back into the church. So, so penance began. Then, there, then just 50 years later, a persecution unlike the last one, so horrible, so much worse, came through. Came from Emperor Diocletian. Now this man, he, one second he promised, he said, I'm not going to bring harm to the Christians. The next second, he was slaughtering them in the masses. The laxity of this group were so much worse. Turns out the fears of some of the people may have been right. But they weren't called the laxity, they were called the traditors. Because these people, what they did, is they actually were people who had grabbed the church's few copies of scripture because books were rare because they had to be handwritten at this time. And they delivered it over to the Roman government for the Roman government to burn. And then they also delivered up names of the church members and of the clergy so that they too would be dragged off, burned, and killed, and thrown in prison. So you can imagine if the church was reluctant to forgive those who lapsed 50 years earlier, how much more would the traditors? But then this amazing thing happened just two years after this amazing, crazy persecution, awful persecution, Constantine rose to power. Do you remember Constantine from your history classes? He was a Roman man who uh, was losing in war. And he said, and then he said, why not? I'll try the Christian's God. And so he prayed to the Christian God. And he said, and he said, God of the Christians, if you will grant me this victory, I will be Christian. And sure enough, he won. And then Two years later, immense whiplash in the country. Everyone was Christian. Christian became popular. And so the traditors realized it was no longer convenient to be anti-Christ. And so they begged and they wept to get back into the church. They struggled through this a lot. And the church was less than forgiving. The church actually butt heads. There was two sects in the church. 
And this one sect was known as the Donatist, and they were like, they were the legalists of the group. They were so legalistic, they said if there was any sin whatsoever in a bishop's life, if we catch a bishop lying, his baptisms and, his, and any time he served communion were considered invalid. We need to go back and rebaptize those people. That's how strict the Donatists were. And so you can imagine how forgiving they were of the uh, traditors. They were not. And so this ended up with the church butting heads with the Donatists and kicking the Donatists out. And then offering penance to the traditors, the traitors. And over time, penance has developed into pay this fine and do this pointless task to be forgiven of your sins. Penance became a way to get back into good graces with God. Essentially, it was this message that you want to be saved again, you're going to have to work for it. Penance is not biblical. Penance is not the way. How do I know this? Because we actually have an account in Scripture of someone who denied Jesus not just once, not just twice, but three times. And it's amazing what Jesus did to him, what Jesus made him do. Let's look with it. John chapter 21. John chapter 21. See how Jesus punished this man. For being a traitor. Just because I, I fear losing some of you with that strong language, uh, spoiler warning, he doesn't punish me. John chapter 21. If you'd go with me to verse 15. Let me just give some background here. Peter denies Jesus three times. Jesus goes off, gets tried and killed. Three days later, Jesus resurrects. Peter's one of the first people to Jesus' tomb. And as he's at the tomb, this angel comes by and says he's risen. And then Peter goes back to, to the disciples. And as he's sitting there in a room with his disciples, hiding from the Romans, Jesus walks through the wall, says, peace be with you, reveals himself to Peter, who just denied him three times, just three days earlier, and to the rest of the disciples. And then you know what he does? He doesn't say, you there, get out of the room. You can't be a part of this. You, cho you made your choice. Denied. No, he doesn't do that. You know what he says? He says, Peter, come here. Touch this hole in my wrist. Touch this hole in my side. It's me. I'm alive. He revealed himself to Peter. And Peter's weakest hour. And then a few days later, he calls the disciples out to the shore. And he has them fish to eat. And then verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Meaning more than fish, more than Peter's occupation as a fisherman. And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. And then he said to him, tend my lambs. Hold up. So that's Jesus' great punishment. Jesus goes up to Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Okay, then. Yeah, you're back in. Tend to my lambs. He has a job to do. Just like that. Isn't that amazing? But Jesus isn't done because not, now that he's forgiven Peter, Peter needs to be restored. Verse 16. He then said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, shepherd my sheep. Verse 17. And then he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved. Because he said to him a third time, because he had to say it three times, do you love me? And so he says to him, Lord, you, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Three times, Peter denied Christ. And so three times, Jesus makes him reaffirm his love. Peter, you want back in? It's as simple as this. 
Do you love me? And let me put this in context because um, what, what Jesus is saying is, is Peter, do you agape me? An agape, many of you have actually heard a wrong definition for agape. I, mean, I hate to tell you that. But agape is actually a generic word for love. You can say you agape a slice of pizza and then turn around and say you agape your wife or your spouse. And um, so agape can be used in a variety of contexts. It's actually the closest word in the Greek to our word for love. You know how we use our word for love in all kinds of different ways? That's agape. It can be a great love. It can be a little love. The leo, Peter's response, is actually the one that's, that's, that's greater. So Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me? Just, just plain out, do you love me? Do you love me at all? Do you love me? And then Peter is saying, Jesus, I phileo you. And phileo has a little more stricter meaning. It talks about a brotherly love, a friendly love, an attachment. You can use it of something. You wouldn't really use it for pizza. You may use it for like your childhood blankie that you have a personal strong attachment to. But most of the time you're going to use it for someone that you love as a brother. Someone that you consider family. Maybe a really close friend. That's for later. And so Peter is saying, is saying, and doing his normal Peter thing where he, where he you know, uses stronger language. Peter's a very outspoken guy. That's what he does. If he really feels something, you will know. Peter's a passionate dude. And so when Jesus is saying, Peter, do you agape me? He's saying, Jesus, I don't want just agape. I have to lay on you, Jesus. I love you. Why would you ask me that? And so he brings Peter back slowly and lets him reaffirm his love three times undoing the denials three days before. That's repentance. See, we come up with this thing called penance that's not biblical, but there is a thing called repentance. And repentance means to change your mind. It means to turn around. It means if you're doing wrong and you're going in a bad way, you stop doing the wrong, you turn around and you walk the other way. So what do you do with those who have lapsed? Those who have lapsed back, not, let's just say, they, not just denial of Christ, but let's, let's broaden it. What if you've gone back to a former sin? What if you've done something that, you, that someone's already forgiven you for? What do you do? Is there any hope for you? Is it over? Here's what you do. You stop doing it. You stop walking in that way of sin. You regret that sin. You turn from it, and then you commit to doing better. You recommit your love to God. And you turn back to Him. And guess what? That's the powerful thing about grace. Grace is so powerful. God is so loving, so forgiving, so merciful. We ought to follow God over man because He is graceful. He has forgiveness. So, whatever your sin Whenever you lapse back into a whole way of life, whenever you betray people, turn back and reaffirm your love for God and walk in it. That's what Jesus does for Peter. He says, Peter, now that you've affirmed your love, you need to walk in it. Verse 18, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now, he's, this he said signifying by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. And then he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Re resends the invitation. He says, Peter, do you love me? Then walk with me. So people, whatever sin you've done in the past, Turn from it. Repent and follow Jesus. Acknowledge Him as your Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. Amen. If you're on this side of eternity, that always holds true for salvation. It will always get you out of hell and get you into good graces with God because that's our God. He is that loving. He is that kind. That's the God we serve. So repent and believe. It holds true to this day. Now I have a friend who, um, I'm going to walk down to this mic. I had a friend who majorly strayed from his walk with the Lord. Did some horrible things. And he's a wonderful musician. And I always remember this song because it was such a heartfelt prayer for him. 
It really was him stepping back into good relationship with God. I just want to share with you a, a lyric from it, the chorus, really. He said, God, I've taken your temple, I'm talking about his body, I've taken this body that you've given me and I've burned it to the ground. And then he says, is there more grace for me? Is there more grace for me at all? It's a powerful prayer because he knows the answer. The answer is, yes, there is more grace because that's our God.